Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. See with me. Oh, Hero of Heaven, You conquered the grave. And you freed every captive. You break every chain. Oh, God, You have done great things. We dance in Your freedom. our Savior, the name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. So yeah. he's been faithful, amen. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You freed every captive, break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Oh, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, and hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Break it. 
together today church come on sing with me shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus I'm gonna sing it one more time here we go Church, would that be true for us today? That no matter what we face, we speak the name of Jesus, amen? Because it's in and through him that we can do things, amen? Yet not I, but Christ through me. Let's sing this together. One gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Believe those words today. Night is dark. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken. For 
by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoice, for in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, to this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deep. This valley he will be. Oh, the night, oh, the night has begun, and I shall overcome yet not I, but through Christ. No fate I dread, no fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future, the future sure, the price it has been paid. Jesus bled, Jesus bled, and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this, to this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my King. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free and not I, but through Christ. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will until i stand with joy before the throne Again, church, take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2. Uh, today we're going to be looking at verses 4, or excuse me, 22 down through uh, 41. Acts 2, 22 down through 41. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking to you a, a message that I've titled a, a picture of a living church. A picture of a living church. We're going to look at a couple of characteristics. Uh, I've really only got two, and then I'm going to give you a bonus uh, that I've just thrown in there because I love you and I've missed you. Um, and and I, I hope it will be a, an encouragement to you, uh, and, and I hope also it will be a, a challenge to each one of us that would call this place home. Acts chapter 2, we're starting in verse 22. If you found it, say amen. amen. How about y'all over here? Y'all you, you clustered up and ain't talking back this morning. Amen. Y'all, you, you guys bring a Bible? 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to call y'all out this morning, all right? Are y'all ready to have church? I don't know of anything in our lives that ought to be more of a celebration when, when the body of Christ gathers around the Word of God, amen? It really should be. Uh, it really should bring some excitement into our heart. And I ain't fussing with you. I'm just trying to poke the bear a little bit this morning, all right? But it should be an exciting thing for us, amen? Can I have a witness? Can, thank you, Amen. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. I'm glad David wasn't a Baptist. Some of you will get that after lunch today. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption." This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as our Lord God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Lord, we are amazed as we read your word at this earth-shaking truth, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from this great news, this gospel of Jesus, not a single one of us have the hope of heaven. But Lord, because of this great truth, the gospel of Jesus, anyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved and forever will be saved, Lord. Thank you for the gospel. I, I pray in these next moments 
that you would bless and anoint our time around the word of God. May it accomplish uh, things that no man could accomplish on his own, but through the aid of your spirit, God, would you call sinners to repent? And Lord, would you stir the church unto revival? That Lord, that we would see again the hand of God upon your people to send us out to do great and wonderful things. May we honor you with this time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What takes place in the verses following verse 22 and down Uh, Peter begins to give to those who were gathered that day there at Pentecost what is known as a messianic Christology. Uh, What does that mean? Well, he is preaching to them and dealing with their great confusion about who and even what Jesus Christ really was. Now, what's interesting is they're still in our day with so many, even globally, about who and what Jesus Christ really is to the world. And by the way, if you arrive at anything other than he is the Messiah, the Son of God, you are completely wrong. Amen. And so so what takes place, let me give you the setup here. Pentecost has come. It came because what Jesus, you remember, he ascended into the clouds and he, he, they, the angel comes and the angel tells them to, men, why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus who went up in the clouds will in like manner return. It was there on the Mount of Olives and they go now in and they are gathered together in the upper room. You remember that the Spirit of God came upon them and they began to speak with unknown tongues uh, there in that room and they all heard in their own language. This wasn't a heavenly gibberish or a, 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 some angelic language, but they were given this supernatural ability to communicate the gospel in a way that everybody heard in their own language. So in other words, it's a picture of that God gave me to, the ability to speak and, and let's say we have dozens of different languages and they're listed out there who was there uh, and yet all of you heard it in your own native mother tongue. As a result of this, we see many have come to faith in Christ, but here's what you need to also understand. Any movement of God is going to be challenged by the enemy. Now, where this idea came that if God's in it, it's always going to be easy and no opposition, where that, I tell you where it came from, it came from hell, because there's always going to be opposition to the work of God. It's just life. As, as amen spot for the rest of y'all that weren't amen given an amen. Okay, so, so it's going to happen, and it happened here. So the, 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 the Pharisees have gathered, the, the scoffers have gathered, and they're really, again, wanting to, Jesus has ascended to heaven, but they're still poking holes in the fact that they're claiming he was not Messiah. So I, I said we're talking about a, a picture, a portrait of a living church. And by the way, just by that statement alone is also giving an implication that just because you call yourself a church doesn't mean you're a living church. There's often a statement that is said about churches that they are graveyard dead. You ever heard that phrase about a church? Man, that church dead. I wouldn't go up there to that. It happens, right? Well, how does it happen? Well, they move away from exactly what we're going to see here that I think makes this church a living church church. Uh, Number one, if we are a living church, we're going to be a church that teaches the scriptures, a church that teaches the scriptures. Now, I know that sounds probably to some of you like, oh, well, duh. Uh, You know, what an elementary kind of a thing to say. No, no, no. Listen to me. The very foundation of who we are as a people is that we are a people of the book. If you take this book away, you take the word of God away, we don't even know who God is. We get that right. It's not book worship. It's worship of the God of the book. Y'all get that. Jesus wrote one book, and it's been a bestseller uh, since the beginning of time here. It is written that this book is, is not just a history book, but yet it is a book of history. It's not just a science book, but it is a book of science. It is a book that trumps all others. Why? Because the Bible itself says it is alive, it is active, and sharper than a two-edged sword. Through this, we have the living revelation of Jesus Christ unto the world. 
Baptists used to actually smile about that. Amen? Why? Because we so loved our Bibles. We so loved the Word of God. And listen to me. You'd find me any Christian that has a heart that is hot for the things of God, I will point to you a Christian who loves their Bible. They're not trying to find holes in it, but yet they believe it and they believe it from front to back, from Genesis all the way to the maps. I even believe on the back page where it says genuine leather, a cow died to sacrifice itself to wrap around this thing. It is the living, active word of God, people. So Peter stands up in the midst of these scoffers that are looking and saying, oh, come on you're really going to talk about this Jesus. And he just begins to teach the scriptures that you say, well, hang on. They didn't have the canon of the Bible. No, no, no. Peter goes back and goes into the old Testament. Peter begins to, to teach them. This is what was spoken by the prophets. This is what David said. He said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is at the right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. What Peter is doing is he is saying, no, the foundation, I learned this in small group this morning, the very foundation of which the church would be built upon is this single truth that Jesus is the Christ. There's not coming another one. There's not going to be a, a second option. There's one option, it's Jesus or none. Around this world, there are tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of false gods, God's little G. They're worshiped constantly. One of those that is worshiped probably more than any is the God of self. That's happening here in this text, though it doesn't say it in so many words. You see it constantly through the life of, of many of the Jews because they were worshiping self. You, they, they called it that Jehovah God, but what they're worshiping is their ability to keep the law. They would hold up this standard to say, look at my track record. And by the way, before you get down on them, you know, there's a lot of Baptists that do the same thing. There's a lot of people sitting in our church pews uh, here today that, that do the same thing. I checked into church. I must be good. Uh, I've, I've, I've served in the nursery. Amen. That ought to get anybody at least out of, you know, out of, out of, out of earth and into the, to the edge of the pearly gates, right? I survived. I, I went to vacation Bible school. I ate the snacks. So those are good. Amen. But, but, but I, I've done those, those, I've tithed. Well, it was more of a tip, but I, I gave some money. And we hold up this, this list. It's the same thing the Jews were doing. And yet God declared in, here again in his word, if we're teaching the scriptures, he said, all your righteousness is as filthy rags. Collectively, us together. Because, we, we, I, I mean, I'm looking at, and y'all are some good-looking folks. Turn to your neighbor and say, oh, you're pretty. Amen. Hey, some of you lying. Anyway. I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. These are good looking folks. I mean, smart. I can tell some of y'all like you got some stuff happening up there. Some of you like, I love ice cream. Amen. But collect, listen to me, collectively, the absolute best all of us could pull together I'm talking about make a list of every good thing you've ever done, every good thought. Because I've got more good thoughts than I've got good deeds. And you, you probably can't relate. I've had good thoughts about doing something good that I didn't do. You're like, well, doesn't that count for something? Yeah, filthy rags. It's trash. It's garbage. All of us collectively together couldn't get one sinner into heaven. Because the Bible would point to this truth that to break one point of the law is to break it all. Now you start over. You say, well, then there's no hope. No, the hope is Jesus. That's what Peter's pointing to. That's the only way you'll get access to heaven. He's teaching the scriptures. Move on down in verse 29. Men and brethren, he said, let me speak to you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. And what he's doing is he's saying, y'all need to quit worshiping David. Some of them worship him. He's like, the dude's dead. Go over and look. There's his tomb. I can take you to his tomb right there in Israel. He, he's still, 
Dude ain't getting up. But not Jesus. He goes on and he follows this. He said, some of you are so tied to David, the, the, the dead king, that you can't adhere to, follow, and worship the only living king, who is Jesus. David is still in his cave, in his tomb. Jesus is on his throne, but you'd rather worship a dead king than a living God. And you know, we're still faced with the same thing today. The same choice is there for you and I. We've got to determine whether or not we will worship a dead God or a living God. Dead God, you got a smorgasbord. Dead God, you can go with Buddha, the, the quiet fat man that sits around and, and, and watches over the buffets as you go in uh, to eat. He's a cute little guy, amen. I'm sure he would love little Debbie's. Looked like he probably loved him too much. Can I tell you about old Buddha? He did. You can pick Muhammad, Muhammad uh, leading and has led billions around the globe as the prophet of Allah. Can I tell you about old Muhammad? Dead. You know, the list can just go on and on. Some worship Confucius because they're confused ish. I ain't got a good word for that, but y'all get where I'm going. There's only one. That's what Peter's trying to declare to them here. There's only one who looked death in the face and conquered. There's only one that went into the grave, carried, but walked out. And his name is Jesus. He said in verse 32, this Jesus whom God has raised up, of which we all are witnesses. The word witnesses there is the word martus, which is, is a, a, a a word that where we get our word martyr, that, that's what it is to be a, a witness. He said, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father promises of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. In other words, he's saying this whole phenomenon, because they're amazed all these people spoke in these tongues and they had these cloven tongues of fire on top of them. He said, what you see... Uh, and are amazed by, this happened because of the power of a living God. He said in verse 36, therefore let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. And I love the boldness of Peter. He didn't have to say you. He could have said this Jesus who died. But he said this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Here again, pulling no punches, Peter is declaring there is only one option. It's Jesus, period. So in other words, if preacher make that plain, great, I will. When you die, by the way, you will. I don't mean to be morbid, but you will. And I know our culture is still shocked by that even though we've got thousands of years of, of a track record, all my ancestors now are dead. Yours? Um, yet you're shocked if it happens to you or somebody close to you. Have you noticed that? It's like, oh, they can't be. We talked about that in small group this morning. It's like there's this denial. Oh, they can't be. No, it's going to happen. I don't know how, and I know we would all like to determine how, right? I mean, I, I, I'd like to have, like, just, just, just pass in my sleep while I'm eating a strawberry shortcake roll from Little Debbie. Amen. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be nice if you could just pick, like, you know, not necessarily when, but how. It was like, just right before he got the gut rot, he ate his last little Debbie, amen? 
That would be so good. I'm going to write a hot check on the day before. <laughs> Amen. Just, I'm not advertising that. I guess I just did. Not pre- <laughs> it happens to us all. And when that happens, however that happens, whenever that happens, did you realize that there's only one or two places that you're going to go and spend eternity? Now, I've got a friend of mine that says it this way. He said, you don't have to go to heaven. He said, you don't have to go to hell, but you can't stay here. Now, some of us act like we're going to stay here. Everything about us is an an investment into this world. Come back here again. If we teach the scriptures, we find this to be an error, a damnable error. You will not, you cannot, you shall not stay here on this earth. You will step one day in a moment in the twinkling of an eye into eternity and it will be heaven or it will be hell. And Peter is declaring here to all these that are watching and us who are listening, if you choose Jesus, it is heaven forevermore. If you reject him, it will be hell for all eternity. No return trip, no second chances, no comebacks. Hell for all eternity. Listen to me. Please hear what I'm about to say. This is the driving force of my life. This singular truth that all men, women, boys, and girls will step into a Christless eternity unless somebody gets them the gospel. This is why we go to Africa. This is why we're going to East St. Louis. And yes, this is why I go into town, into the dark places like Fort Gibson and Tahlequah, and I tell people the glorious gospel because you can go to hell from there as well. It will not always make you a popular person. But I'm going to make a statement to you this morning that you may not, you'll probably agree with, but I'm not sure that in practical terms we always want to live out. Your chief purpose here on this earth is not to make friends. It's not. Now there's a lot in the church today that have bought that to be true. No, we don't say that. That's not a good t-shirt because it's obviously it's theologically Um, heresy, but yet in all practical terms, that's often how we navigate through life. I just want to make friends. I mean, and and we'll mask it. Well, you can't give them the gospel unless you've been a friend to them. Well, dear ma'am or sir, when are you going to get around to the gospel? Because if I have to mask truth to be your friend, I am not being your friend. That's why he's teaching the scriptures. Peter was taking a great risk here. Hey, by the way, that, that, was, that was the easiest part of the whole text. The second component of this whole thing is that you tell the truth. It's not just teaching the scriptures. You tell the truth. Look, look further with me. If that hadn't got you stirred up, maybe this will. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Translation, that provokes some folk. And they, they said, Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, well, um, join a church, tithe and serve, be quiet, don't cuss in the lobby, be sure and, and check in on Facebook, but it doesn't count. Um, be kind as often as it's convenient and I'm sure God will let you in. Peter had an opportunity to make friends. Peter chose to make disciples. There's a major difference. Now, some of you may have the, the, the inkling to say, well, preacher's saying we need to be rougher on folks. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying love them enough to tell the truth. Don't short sell them. Don't cheat them and say, well, I mean, I'm sure you're okay. Why are you sure of that? Peter is so clear. He said, repent. 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He goes on and gives this great picture for the promise is to you and to your children and to all, to all that messes with my Calvinist friends who are afar off as many as, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, as the Lord our God will call. To all. So the Lord Jesus has offered this to all. You and I have a mission and a mandate to tell it to all. Church, we're in, we're in a time in our nation, the nation that I dearly love, that it's probably going to cost us if we tell the truth. And, and, and it, it, it's probably going to cost us, for one, because we've not done a great job at the first part, which was teaching the Scriptures, We've sacrificed it so much that even, even in church, it's become one of those things that, that is like, do we, need, do we really need that? I'm, just, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I, there's a lot of our churches today that are really struggling with whether or not that's really a relevant thing. I mean, I don't, maybe read a verse or two, but do we really need to take time to teach the scriptures? I mean, can, look, can we sing more? And I'm pro singing. That's all over in our Bible. But we'll not win the world by singing. He said it's through the foolishness of preaching that he would save some. There's this, this idea today that, well, let's just have conversation. Can we just, can we just sit down and talk? And I mean, roast some marshmallows. And I'm all for that. Amen. With graham crackers and the Lord's peanut butter cup in there, the s'mores the way Jesus would. But it won't get anybody saved. I, I don't, I don't want to go to heaven with a lot of friends on earth wondering why I didn't tell the truth. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? They're, they're in my pathway. They're in your pathway. Because you have the opportunity and I have the opportunity. Let's just tell the truth. It's gotten so where we, we compromise so much. There's certain issues even in, of, in and of our day that we're, we're struggling to, to tell the truth. It's almost like, man, don't, don't say it. You'll just see if this sounds familiar. D don't say anything. You're just going to start a fight. Does, does that sound familiar today? Man, don't say anything. You're just going to start a fight. If I had a dollar for every time somebody's told me that, I'd have a truckload of dollars. Don't say anything. You're going to start a fight. Well, if the word of God says it, we should say it. We can't be a church that's just saying, only say the things that will make us popular. Only say the things that will, will make us winsome. Listen to me, winsome is not the chief end of the church. The glory of God is the chief end of the church. Church, I've, I've had you on my heart these last couple of weeks as I've traveled. Um... And I heard the same news that you heard of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. If you haven't heard that, that happened. Welcome to town, those of you that haven't heard that. Um, and there's a, there's a lot being said, and I've, I've been burdened for you. I've prayed for you that I'm seeing a lot that are even now chastising the church to say, well, don't, don't bring it up. You know, it's like spiking the football if you bring it up. No, no, no. We, we should still be a people that celebrate life. I'm not saying you rub something in somebody's face, but I am saying we, we should celebrate life. We should celebrate the fact that life is being protected. There are many today on the, the other social issues of our day that would just say to the church, just, just can you all just... Simmer down. Just calm down. 
Can I just say, I'm, I'm concerned we're way too calm. We're, we're way too calm. There ought to be a passion in us that drives us to be a people that just won't shut up about the gospel. Wherever we go, man, we're telling people, I'm not saying you got to get up in somebody's face and scream at them. They probably won't like that, and you probably should have brushed your teeth. But we lovingly and we passionately let them know there is a Savior. There is a, a way for you to know him. I shared this this morning in our small group, and I'm going to close. We're, we're about out. Y'all are long-winded today. I haven't got to do this for a couple of weeks. Oh, and by the way, just in case you, you, you missed this part, it said with many other words in verse 40, he, he testified and exhorted. So I'm into the many other words now. We went to a school couple, this last week. It's a school called NECA, um, the Northeastern Christian Academy that our friends have uh, started over there in uh, northeast Ghana in the city of Yindi. And I've been to this school many, many times since it was the first birth. I've been there at this school every year. And so I took our team there and it's exciting to see it because all these little kids come out there and they're yelling, you know, white people, white people. And, and, uh, you know, we're, we're a sight to see, I guess. And, uh, and so, uh, they're all walking around and i I've, just confess a little bit. I, I wasn't all that excited about going that morning. I've, I've seen the school. Um, though I was always enjoying my time there, I'm just like, I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's, let's get on the road. And so rather than walk around all over the school, I'm like, I'm just going to go sit down over here and, and chill for a while. And um, there's an older gentleman. I didn't know how old. He just, he's an older guy. And he's sitting there, and I thought he might be, somebody that was homeless that stumbled up onto the school. And so I thought, well, I'll go sit down and shoot the bull with him, you know, and see what, you know, wisdom he can pass on to me. And so we start talking there and, uh, I'm, I'm like, well, sir, have, have you ever had a time in your life that somebody has shared the, the gospel with you? you? Ever heard about Jesus? Um, yes, sir. And I, I said, well, has there ever been a time in your life where you've You've put your faith and your trust in him and repented of your sins. And he goes, no, sir. And I'm like, sir, well, do you, do you understand that hearing is not enough, um, but we've got to act on that, that we've got to put our, our faith, our trust in him, that just hearing the good news, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't do it. It's, it's a call to action. Yeah, yes, sir, I understand. And I said, well, so what in the world would keep you from from?" praying with me right here. Now, mind you, I'm just sitting down to talk to an old man. I didn't go over there with the intention of sharing the gospel with him. So what would keep you from praying with me right now and asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life? You put your trust and your faith in him for salvation, him alone. He said, nothing. I said, so you pray with me? And there was a part of me, don't judge me. There was a part of me that was almost like, okay, well, now I've got to do this too. Because I just wanted to sit down and shoot the bull. I was being lazy. He's like, yeah, I'll do that. And I'm like, okay, so let's pray. And he just began to talk to the Lord. And he asked the Lord to come into his heart and his life and to save him from his sins. God, I've been a sinner and I want to be saved. I put my trust and my faith in Jesus alone. He said those words, in Jesus alone today. He gets done praying. I said, sir, tell me how... How can I, if I could, how old are you? And he said, 93 years old. Dear ones, listen to me. If you're still breathing, you're never too old to be saved. You're never too young to be saved. You're never too far out there to be saved. You've never sinned too much to be saved. To tell the truth is to say that any man, woman, boy, or girl who would repent and put their faith and their trust in Jesus can and shall be saved. Told you I'd give a bonus and we're done. Bonus in verse 41. I'm not preaching. I'm just going to point it out to you and you can go study it. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. By the way, this is the, the standard throughout your New Testament. There's some kind of a false standard in the church today that there's a lot of unbaptized people 
that think they walk with the Lord. Oh, I just don't like that whole water thing and I don't want to get wet in front of my hair and all that stuff. I just don't, you know, you know. There is no such thing as an unbaptized follower of Jesus in the New Testament. It's just not there. Does it save you? No, Jesus saved you. It's the first step of obedience. Jesus walked 75 miles to be saved or to be baptized. It's a big deal. It says, and they were baptized in that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. The picture here is now these people are empowered for for ministry. They're sent out. They're, they're, they're not to just say, hey, now that you've been saved and baptized, we just want you to come and sit in our gatherings. And uh, if you don't mind, at least once a month, act like you're happy to be there. That's, that's not the picture. But the picture is, and you, you know what happens in the book of Acts, my soul. They, 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 they explode with growth. Why? Because they won't shut up about him. Everywhere they're going, and you'll see this in the next verses, that they, they, they just keep doing this thing that he's called them to do. They, they go, they gather, and then they scatter to share. They come, they gather, they scatter to share. We figured out how to come and gather. The question is, will we scatter to share? Maybe, maybe you're not sharing is because you've not yet started believing. You know, I wasn't sharing until I got saved. I wasn't. Until I got saved, I had no motivation. But boy, I'm telling you, when I got saved, I was motivated to share. I was motivated to tell. I didn't have to go to a class, by the way, for that. I didn't have to go through training for that. I just, just like, I'm just gonna bumble through this. Was I scared? Absolutely, because I'm like, I don't wanna mess this up. But I couldn't stop talking about what Jesus had done for me. Question is, two, I got two questions. Number one, are you sharing? Number two, have you started believing? Believing what the scriptures teach that no, ma'am, no, sir, you are not, nor will you ever be good enough to earn salvation. That's why Jesus did it for you.